wanted to be an archaeologist because, as she put it, she loved digging into the past. She studied Greek and Latin at Stanford, went to Oxford on a Fulbright, and by the time she turned 32, she was running one of the major resident theaters in the country. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic and arts columnist of Newsday. And our guest is Carrie Perloff, who turned the classic stage company into an off-Broadway success story when she was in her 20s, and in 1992 was handed San Francisco's American Conservatory Theater, in debt, <laughs> made homeless by the earthquake, and very conservative. That about sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I suspect that no one was as surprised as you were. When about you, ACT? Yeah. Well, I'm very fatalistic, you know, about many things, including jobs. And uh, I went out to do that interview thinking, it's fine with me if I don't get it because I love New York. I never thought I'd leave New York. I never thought I'd leave CSC. I was completely happy to be in 200 seats. I had no ambition to run a 1,000-seat theater. Those are the jobs you get. Yeah, yeah. I also was very naive. I had no idea how bankrupt ACT was. <laughs> I had no idea what was ahead of me. But then I also believe if you knew these things, you'd never do them. So I like to go into things slightly blindly. Now, here you are. First of all, people aren't giving theaters away to women that much. You uh, ran a, what, a million dollars if yep. it was a lot budget yep. right. for your little 200-seat right. theater, right. which was yeah. lovely and wonderful. And then, and then you go out there, and not <laughs> only, you, you probably said your, during your interview, I'm not a naturalist. I don't like living room drama. I'm sick of this. I want new <laughs> that. And they, how did you, how, what was the thinking in the board with you? I mean, it's There's delightful. a visionary, incredible man who ran the board called Alan Stein. And I said to Alan, you know, he was like my Medici. I thought three times in your life, if you're lucky as an artist, you find someone like that who will believe in you. And for whatever reason, and I don't know, Alan looked at me and thought, this is the person. You know, he said to me, it has to change, it's going to be difficult, you have to have prodigious energy, you have to believe in it, you have to go out in the community and tell people why this is important, and we'll stand behind you. And I mean, my first season was insane. Everything I did was on the front page of the paper, it was totally it controversial. Was historic. Unintentionally. It was historic. Yes. <laughs> I did not go there to make waves. Uh -huh. And everything, the Catholic Church boycotted everything, I was called up before the Archbishop. I mean, it was truly amazing. At the end of which I thought, well, Alan will invite me to his house and tell me it was a good ride, but it's time to go home. And he said, now you have to press forward. You have to keep doing what you've done. Let the subscribers go who are upset about non-traditional casting or unusual programming and we'll bring new people. And now, 10 years later, we have 20,000 subscribers. It's the youngest subscription base in the country. They're young, energetic, eager people who demand really challenging theater. They never ask for pablum ever. So. It can happen, but it was a long process. I mean, it's a very sophisticated audience yes. in San Francisco. Anyway, the opera is very sophisticated. Michael Tilson Thomas has done right. some wonderful things at the, at the Philharmonic. And yeah. I was surprised that they sort of freaked out so yeah. much on your first season. Well, Let, let's, help, let's help them a little bit. The first season you started, oh, out, you canceled I Lend did, Me a Tenor. I canceled Lend Me a Tenor because our things. students had had big blackface issues at the school and I didn't want to get into that again. I replaced it with the Dario Fo play. Um, the Pope and the, the Pope Witch. and the Witch about free abortion on demand. This did not go over well with the Catholic Church. One of my great five year later victories was when Dario Fo won the Nobel Prize and I got to go on the Lara News Hour <laughs> and talk about what a great person he was after everyone had said to me, Why are you doing yeah. this vile thing? Then we had Robert Woodruff directing The Duchess of Malfi, which was scatological beyond belief, a very beautiful Naked production. Naked and in chains. Naked and in chains. It was a really exciting production, but that caused a lot of waves. Um, then we did Antigone and they said, We don't see, we don't do Greek tragedy here. You know, they didn't want to. By the end, though, uh, they kind of got excited about the literature and about the artists. I wanted, to, I wanted ACT to be a place again for really th the best American stage actors we could find doing really vigorous material. And for example, they had done relatively little non-traditional casting. So when I did an Uncle Vanya with a black astrof and a Japanese-American Sonia, that caused a lot of waves, which surprised me in a city that's the most multicultural city in America. Now, they totally embrace it. I'm doing Godot right now with two white actors and two black actors, and it hasn't even been an issue. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it just needed to be shaken loose, I think. Um, and the kind of people in San Francisco who weren't going to ACT needed to be encouraged to come, and then some of those people needed to be encouraged not to go. Uh, is you there know? much complaining about the people who don't have their theater anymore? 
No. I mean, I think they really came along. I yeah. think they got excited. Now Pamela Rosenberg's going through the same thing at the opera because the opera is deeply conservative yes. and she's doing extremely exciting work. So I also have to say, since this is the title of the program, not to be paranoid about it, but I think it was harder. Because they were more nervous because I was a woman and because I was a young woman. They kept thinking, what if she's wrong? What if she really doesn't know what she's doing? Who is she anyway? And it made and didn't them you nervous. Have, yeah, it, and didn't you have to do fundraising and stuff? Oh, I mean, huge. And I had to raise $28 million. For the theater. Yeah, yeah. For the Geary to Theater. The that, Geary had, that had been ruined in the earthquake. And how, how big is your staff? Well, the permanent staff, you know, about 700 people pass through ACT or 1,000 every year. The permanent staff is maybe 75. It's a big staff. It took a huge amount of, of um, uh, you know, sort of emotional rebuilding, that theater, because it was, it was really emotionally bankrupt. They'd been through very hard times. Um, and it took a lot of hiring and a lot of reanimating to, to make that happen. And then, you know, what I was very used to from CSC, which was having to go out and say to people, this is why this matters. But that part I don't mind. Because I studied ancient Greek, I always think theater is the center of the polis. That's what the theater is. It's the place, the public of differing opinions comes together to see each other reflected in metaphor in some way. So if they're not interested, then the theater doesn't exist, which doesn't mean you do commercial theater that panders to the lowest common denominator, but you really invite them to engage. So I did town meetings my whole first year. They all stood up and screamed at me, screamed at me. Did you do, do, you do you study guides? Are you still everything. doing study guides? Oh, my God. For all your subscribers, you send them out you, what everything. they should know? It's all called the... Words on Plays. Yeah. You can read interviews with everybody involved in the show. You can come hear Tom Stoppard talk about his play or Pinter. You can come backstage and see. I, mean, I do anything I can to get the audience into the making of the work because then they're invested. Then they don't walk out after 10 minutes saying, wow, well, I didn't get it. And, and you're really you, a word person. I mean, you know. I'm a word person. We got Stafford. We got, we got Pinter. I, we got, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I read that Pinter was the reason you got into the theater, which, That's of course, right. is, is a little bit out of step with most of the people who grew up because, you know, went in the theater because they liked uh, Peter Pan. No. To me, it was the quintessential. Beckett and Pinter were... Um, the quintessentially extraordinary thing that theater could do, which was to distill human experience into absolutely economical, stunning minimalism in which, you know, every word carried its own freight. And uh, I, I just remember the first time I read The Birthday Party, what it meant to me. And then the first, one of the first shows I did at CSC was The Birthday Party. And then I reprised it when he gave us the premiere of Mountain Language at CSC. And my daughter was born right then. So I always connect my daughter with Pinter because she was two weeks old and she was hiding in the dressing rooms backstage. And Gene Stapleton would come and say, I think the princess is hungry now. And then I'd go back and breastfeed her because he never wanted, he doesn't like children. Pinter. Well, yeah, I, I, he didn't want to know that I had a child. Yeah, I mean, how dare um, you? <laughs> how dare I? Because it might interrupt the play. Yeah. And so uh, I think about that all the time. So one of the things I so much wanted to do at ACT was bring Pinter to ACT. It had not been done often. So we did Old Times, which is one of the great, great Pinters. And then we did his new play, Celebration, which happened right during 9-11. And that was an incredible experience to do his first play and his newest play back to back right at that moment was an incredible experience. How did you get permission to Mountain Language? You did the, the American yeah. premiere. Yeah. Of Mountain well, I had gotten to know him by then, and we, I think we're basically two Eastern European Jews, you know. This is how I feel about Stoppard. You know when Stoppard sort of finally came out as a Jew and in Talk Magazine and wrote this whole thing about how he discovered who he really was? I laughed because I love him so much, and I thought, I knew that all along because my mother's Viennese, and he reminded me of everybody I grew up with. And I think that's why both those writers appealed to me so much in ways that other British writers have not, mm -hmm. um, is that also because... European Jews are always slightly um, closeted in some way. Language and passing are a big part of their experience, and that really interested me. So both those are writers whom I've, I've spent a lot of time with actually in the rehearsal room. And interestingly, this is an odd detour, but it's why I also stopped writing myself and then started again. Because oh, so I really that? started as a writer. I started as an archaeologist, as you said. <laughs> Um, and then I really was writing, and when I started directing Pinter, I thought, it doesn't get better than this. What am I doing trying to write? I'm never going to, you know? So I stopped. Um, and years later, I've come back to it. And now I've been writing a lot. 
I'm, he, um, just finished a new play about archaeology, about two archaeologists and a missing statue. And I guess I feel like now, having been in the field a long time, I accept the fact that I will never be Pinter or Stafford, but that's okay. I have something else I want to say, you know, which I didn't feel 20 years ago. I, and you did Arcadia. Please, God. Absolutely. And I've done all the yeah. Staffords. Oh, you've done um, all my favorite plays. Invention of Love. Yes. We did the American premiere. Indian Ink. We did the American yeah. premiere. We did Night and Day last year, which is a wonderful early play about foreign correspondence. And because I had gotten so interested in and upset by the, the, the issues about international journalism. Danny Pearl was at Stanford when I was at Stanford. Uh, Julie McCarthy, who's an NPR, wonderful NPR correspondent who's always in danger in the Middle East and who I listen to a lot, uh, made me think about this. I wanted to do a play about journalism. And so I went back to this. And Tom came and did some rewriting of it with us. And it was really fascinating uh, to re-explore an early play of his from the 70s. Now, you, before you got this job, you also used to say, in every interview, why do they only give the women the women slots? <laughs> How come if there's going to be a mother in it, then they give it to the woman to direct? That's right. I don't want the woman slot. I want the Shakespeare slot. Has that changed? No. No. One of the great <laughs> things about running a theater is that not only can you choose plays that you want to do that challenge you, but you can look at other women and say, what do you really want to direct that no one else is going to give you to direct? So Tina Lando come, is coming and doing Time of Your Life, and Kyle Donnelly did a big Somerset Mom play for us last year. And, <laughs> and I mean, all kinds of, you know, it's really a pleasure to see women tackling big, meaty things um, that are not necessarily domestic. What, what I always reacted against was, was the constrict of having to be domestic. Partly because I love theater that's metaphoric. I'm not particularly interested in the literal kitchen table. And I always laugh that I'm not very good with props. So plays where people have a lot of cigarettes and stuff like that, I never know where the ashtray goes. You know, I, that's why I love the Greeks. It's just out there on a bare stage. Um, and so I always looked for sort of larger than life material. And I think we have to fight for women to be able to be part of the public sphere. Otherwise, we're always relegated to the private stories. Which doesn't mean that that's not a big part of our makeup, but I wanted us out of the living room. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find a way to do that. I couldn't, and, unless it was my own theater, it was very hard to find a way that people would actually trust women with the bigger projects, partly because that's where the money is. Yeah. You know, bigger plays are more expensive and riskier. What, uh, speaking of where the money is, a lot of resident theaters define their success now by whether or not they are able to transfer a play to Broadway and make some money and get their name you know, on the Tony Awards. This is not a pressure of yours. And you know, we've sent a lot of plays a lot of places. Um, having a commercial success on Broadway, you know, if it were a play I really adored and was excited about, I would, I would be delighted. But it's not where I put most of my energy. And your board doesn't say, how no. come this isn't, where's ours? No. No, because um, look at, I hate to say it, what most of the work is on Broadway, you know. Uh, I mean, that was never what I aspired to. I'm really interested in literature, and I'm interested in literature that will survive. And I think most really exciting new plays are never going to find a home on Broadway. They just wouldn't survive. I mean, it's almost impossible. And, um, and certainly not classical theater. It's impossible. Yeah, certainly not with an American accent. N absolutely not. And the American conservatory theater exists to nurture American artists, not to import British actors to do Uncle Vanya. That I really feel very strongly about. We run a big school. I care enormously that Americans are proud of their own work and their own language. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult in New York to do a classical play and not have a British star. And I think that's really a problem. So it was really liberating to actually be able to do the work I wanted to do and not feel that that was uh, the pressure. So what happened to the Carrie who was studying at Oxford? I mean, where would you make the jump to theater? Well, I fell in love with a guy at college who was doing theater. That's the, you know, of course, embarrassing truth. But archaeology and theater, you see, to me, were always the same thing, very closely allied. So when I studied ancient Greek, uh, I studied in a great department at Stanford where what you did is stage all the plays in Greek. So that's the first directing I ever did. And it's a great way to learn how to direct because nobody understands. So you have to be crystalline. Every emotional moment, every physical musical moment has to be totally clear because Nobody understands the language. Then I went to Oxford, where I met my husband. And, and he was directed, in the theater, you too. You directed him in a play. And I directed him in a Mayakovsky play. You yes. see, I have a great commercial instinct. Yes, absolutely. Uh, called The Bad Bug. And then I did the Satyricon that caused a lot of scandal there at Oxford. You designed it also. Yeah, I did. Do you still design it all? Sometimes, that, yeah. yeah. I just designed Godot. Um, so, um, 
And Oxford was a big turning point for me. I, it was fantastic because there was so much theater there. And I got to direct and direct and direct, but they didn't teach it. You just did it. And that's something I really actually believe about directing. I'm not sure it's something someone can teach you. It's totally experiential. It's completely intuitive. You take all that you have. You know, I, I had danced for years, so I took all my choreography background and my art history background and my psychology background and my archaeology background and thought, how do I tell this story? Um, and then I learned, really, I feel like everything I know from the actors I worked with, who t really taught me how to talk to an actor. You know, and a really great actor will say to you, that's a really helpful note. That doesn't help me at all. You know, so Judy Ivey, Pamela Reed, Olympia, these are the people who really taught me how to direct, I feel. And it's, an, it's very newsworthy that y this little girl was hired at ACT, but what about this really little girl who was hired at CSC? How did that happen? Well, they were so bankrupt. I, I mean, think what you, they were thrilled 20, that anybody, what? I was 26, 20, but they were so thrilled that, <laughs> I truly think they were so thrilled that anyone would say yes. And uh, I mean, the first job I had at CSC was to hire the fattest actor I knew to sit on the Con Ed grate because we hadn't paid the bill and I didn't want them to get under and read the meter. This is then I realized we hadn't paid our payroll taxes, so I had to learn about tax law and how not to have the padlock on the door. This is really what being an artistic director is. Um, you know, I think I've always uh, just rolled up my sleeves and thought, how do we make this happen? And I have great passion for it. It's, I feel it's a great gift to be in this field, to, to work with extraordinary people to tell great stories, to make things a little more difficult for people, to wake them up a little bit. I think that's why I never had any particular desire to do commercial theater, because I loved the fact that there was this whole other current running uh, downtown in New York that was sort of keeping the art form really alive. And uh, um, I think they just gambled on that at CSC because at that point, they didn't know what else to do. And your casting was so interesting even then. I mean, I was going back in my, my files, mm. and, and you know, Charlotte Ray in, in Happy, Happy Days. Days. Yeah. What a delightful thing, and yeah. who, knew who knew Charlotte Ray? Yes, but you know, first of all, I always look for a place for older women. This is the key. You want great actors, find them, because there's no work. And Charlotte was one of those people that I thought, what an underutilized talent, and she's a musician, so she will respect Beckett, absolutely, because she'll learn to listen to it the way a musician would. Same with Olympia. I mean, Olympia's been one of the great this mentors in my life. This is Olympia Dukakis, in yes. case we didn't uh, do this. Yes. She's been one of the great mentors in my life for 20 years. As She was a great artistic director. She's a great artist of, in many uh, aspects. And, you know, she's pushed me. We've collaborated many, many times on, on many kinds of projects. And I always look for material for people like that. Kathleen Widows, Nancy Dusso, you know, anybody who, all that juicy talent that's so rarely used. That's what well, I'm I I'm sure there's for. some bitty play on Broadway they can revive where everybody <laughs> has to put shoe polish in their hair and walk with their legs spread so that show that Could they're be. old. Yeah, I avoid that. I like sexy women at 70, you know. Um, did, do you have child care center oh, in your theater? Yes. You can't this imagine. Is, I mean, I have not, two children. I've never heard such a thing. Now, this is both yes, but for the audience to. and for well, the Well, I've experimented with child care for the audience, and we've gone in and out with this. We have an incredible young conservatory at ACT, so one of the things we've done is take ch taken children into classes in the young conservatory while parents, you know, go to the theater. Mainly what I focus on is making sure that no artist says they can't come work at ACT because they have children. So I've done everything I can do to bring artists and house their children and find someone to look after their children so that people like Pamela Reed, let us say, can, can or Ellen Karras, who's a wonderful actress from Chicago with two small children, can come work. Um, you know, because I feel like we're losing women to the field because it's very hard to go out of town when you have children. I know it. I hate to leave my children. And I have deep respect for those artistic directors who have hired me and understood that part of hiring me is also that I have a family. And it's very hard to find that. And for us no, it's women bizarre. in the field, I mean, it's bizarre. Oh. well, we hide it. Yeah. We pretend we don't have children. Sure. I mean, in general, you try to be very discreet about it, to, except to other people who have children and who will understand, because the assumption is, oh, well, she'll never be available, or she won't want to work. She has kids. You yeah. hear this all the you time. You said once, you know, I mean, a woman cannot compete you with can't. a single man who can yeah. give 24 hours a day to the, to the project. On the other hand, I constantly feel that, you know, because women have learned how to juggle the care and feeding of, of other people, of their family, and, and their work, that women are the, the most efficient theater artists. 
because you don't waste any time. You do the work and then you go and take care of everything else. There's not a lot of hangout and angst time because you don't have the time to do it, you know? Um, on an average, how many of you, the productions a season do you direct? Well, I usually do two on the main stage. I usually do a student project because I love working with the students. I often do a second stage show and then I often do one show out of town. So it's a lot, although now I'm writing a lot more. So I'm really trying to carve out the summer when I can go to the O'Neill or go somewhere else and really write, which has been fantastic. You know, I, I think it's really important every 10 years that you do something totally different. Yeah, I believe in serial lives. I really Absolutely. do. And yeah. this right now, writing has become my solace. It's been thrilling. And I don't think I would have felt that way. And it's also that I can now hand my work to other directors, you know, Ooh, which is a you're great... You're not going to direct it? No. Ooh. And that's a real pleasure. And I'm a very um, collaborative playwright. I sort of hand it over and say, do what you want to do, cast it the way you want to cast it. Um, so it's just a different way to use my mind. And I, I think life is more interesting when you don't always play the same role. So I, this has been a whole different chapter for me. Do you see most of the resident theaters getting boxed into more and more conservative work because... Unfortunately, yes, although there are the terrific people out there trying sure. to resist that. And I, I love going to see the work around the country, and I've seen fantastic work. But I do think uh, that people are getting um, very nervous about producing something that doesn't come with an imprimatur from New York, um, which means it's harder and harder to get theaters to premiere So material. everyone does the same three plays. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. And then you look at our season, and it's always this strange, wild mix of things. And um, it certainly, it probably makes it harder in some ways. But I try to resist being sort of mick theater and doing the same five plays. You know, I think what I really love is eccentricity and individual taste. And I think every theater should represent the individual taste of its artist. And not just the sort of generic, now we should be doing proof because everyone's done proof. But it's hard to do that and survive. You were talking positively about your subscription base. Are is the subscription philosophy over? I mean, are there, is there a whole generation of people who don't want to plan? Look, they don't have to plan. You have to say subscription is like a commitment to date. That's all it is. That's what I tell our subscribers. You have to agree to date us seven times a year. You don't have to tell us when the date's going to be, or you don't have to love every date, and you can choose sort of how you want to shape it. So we have the most flexible subscriptions. You can change your subscription the day of if you can't come. You, we do every kind of group there. We do things with families. We do discussion series or whatever. And you know, I'm actually always in awe of people who are willing to say, I'll pick the seven. I don't even know what they're going to be, all of them, but I trust this well, theater trust. enough to do. Exactly. But they're you're... not an old, more abundant audience. They yeah. happen to be, you know, we have 3,000 student subscribers, but that's because we've really gone out there and fought for that. Um, as a model, it's undergoing a lot of shifts, and I think the whole way theater is marketed is really changing. You know, partly what scares me is that theater demands an attention span that is shrinking in this country. People have very, very short attention spans now, and I love three-hour plays about meaty subjects, and I have to admit that there are times I think, I don't know if this literature is going to survive. A big Tennessee Williams play or a big Irene Fornes something or whatever, Susan Laurie Park's work, you know, are people going to pay attention enough? Yeah. It's one thing if you create an event. If you say this is six hours and you have to bring your lunch, then it's special event theater and people right. psych up for it. Right. But right. the three-hour play. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the three-hour play with the two intermissions. Yeah. Those it's are hard. killers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, national theater. There was some talk recently in New York about how they're part of the function of the 9-11 complex, the downtown complex, Ground Zero complex, mm -hmm. should, be, should be used for a national theater. And what they meant by that was um, a showcase where the best from the, or the most interesting from mm -hmm. the resident theaters could right. come to New York. It seemed to me that that's sort of what's already happening. It seemed, I didn't know if it could work or not. What's your feeling? It isn't happening at all. Okay. It's amazing to me that people think it's happening. Um, because if you go around the country and look at the work that's really exciting, none of that's traveling. It's too expensive. The only things that travel to New York are, are, are commercial vehicles, almost never classical theater. The really great classical theater in this country is not in the city. It can't be. 
But there is really great theater happening all over. And for example, it always killed me that all those years Mark Lamos ran Hartford Stage that his Shakespeare productions never came here. That was the best of the American theater. That should have been seen in New York. This is happening all over the country. And I remember when we did Three Penny Opera, which has never had an American recording. There is no good <laughs> recording. And we had Nancy Dusso, B.B. Newworth, um, Anika Noni Rose, our student, who then became this great singer, Lisa Roman, Phil Kasnoff. Um, it was sort of really the definitive American group of people working on Three Penny Opera. Now, it was never going to be commercially viable. It's huge, and it's Brecht vile. It's not hairspray. I mean, it's difficult. That kind of thing isn't going to, how would that come to New York? It's not going to be viable commercially, and it's not going to come to the nonprofit. But these are kinds of things that so, that are what keep, is keeping the American theater alive. And then there are a lot of new plays, many new plays that never come to New York. I mean, many, many, many. Seattle is full of them. South Coast Rep is full of them. Um, Chicago is full of them. And I have to say, I think it's a kind of amazing arrogance in New York, the assumption that it's all here. The infrastructure doesn't exist to support it here. So when you read the, uh, that story, which I'm sure you did, did you well, think... Well, I've been a big part of did you think, making okay, that happen. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, so you really, you really yeah. do I think... I mean, it started at ACT because Sean Cullen, who's oh. the actor behind it, came up with the idea when he was at ACT. Wow. Well. Yeah. And uh, I think he's done an incredible job. So and, do you think it's going to happen? Look, Cora Cahan made it work at the Joyce with yeah. dance. It yeah. is not rocket science. It has happened in music. It's happened in dance. There's no reason it couldn't happen in And these would, be, these would be six-week runs of whatever. There are many models. It could yeah. happen in many different ways. Mm -hmm. I don't think the template has been devised yet, but I certainly think if it worked in other art firms, it could work for the theater. Absolutely. And um, how come you weren't lured by living in California to do movies? And this is like not oh, your world? No, I love live experience. There is nothing I love as much. It's why I love dance so much. There's nothing I love as much as real bodies in real time um, experiencing things. And um, I have to admit, it's a terrible thing to say that film to me is just a dead medium. I don't even like going to film. I feel like it's over. Whatever creative thing happened is over, and now it's canned, and now we sit and passively received it. And as you can tell, I'm not such a good person at passivity. I can't sit still that long. I like kinetic live experience. Um, to me, uh, the, ozo the, the, the um, uh, atoms that pass between the performers and the audience um, are transformative. I love that. And so I wanted to keep seeing that happen. And uh, I thought other people were great at film. They should do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that you came, and I wish our time wasn't over, but it is. Uh, Carrie Perloff, thanks so much for being here, and thank you for being here. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.